Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. I am Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for joining us. Today we have on Nick Winkleman, Head of Athletic Performance and Science for Irish Rugby and recent author of The Language of Coaching. Nick's primary role is to oversee the delivery and development of strength and conditioning and sports science across all national and provincial teams. Before working for Irish Rugby, Nick was the Director of Education and Training Systems for Exos and oversaw the speed and assessment component of the Exos NFL Combine Development Program and supported many athletes across the NFL, MLB, NBA, national sports organizations, and military. Nick also has his PhD on motor skill learning and sprinting. So on the show, we talk mainly about the role communication plays in coaching, and here's a hint, it's a big one. More specifically, we get into internal and external cues, how we can use coaching feedback loops, and we discuss the role of attention and so much more. You're going to love this episode, and here is Nick Winkleman. Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Well, I have been a fan of yours for a long time. I think um, before your book came out and, and before we got to spend some time in spring training, I, I really, I think I heard you on a podcast somewhere and I was like, man, this this guy keeps talking about communication and that, that's something that it really piqued my interest because I don't I don't know if, if enough people talk about what effective communication is. I think we we often mention it and we talk about people being effective communicators, but I don't know if we define what that looks like and how to get better at it. And so started reading some of your different uh, slide share posts and, and just really became a fan of yours uh, because you're thinking out of the box and it was something different than what a lot of people were talking about. But for our listeners who, who want to get to know you a little bit better, uh, again, this is a baseball podcast, but yeah. You ha- you came and spoke to us in, in spring training, but that's not your background. But you have yeah. a ton of relevant information that can help us in the baseball world. But for our listeners who want to get to know you a little bit better, can you kind of give us a, a, a short snapshot of your background and why you decided sure. to get into coaching? Sure. Yeah, a- absolutely. So maybe I'll start with the background and then I can give a bit of a story on how I got into it. So by trade, I'm a strength conditioning coach and I, I have been now for over 15 years and interestingly enough, I cut my teeth in s and uh, in baseball. So I was at Oregon okay. State University, get an exercise science degree. Okay. And for my final, for my final, call it internship year, I went and worked uh, in, in the rookie league in Bradenton, Florida with the Pittsburgh Pirates. So, you know, being out there in the middle of summer, whatever it was, four games a week, I had to be mom, dad, strength conditioning coach, driver. And so I learned, <laughs> I learned about the work ethic uh, as, alongside the sport, alongside developing as an s coach. And luckily enough, when I came back from that, there was an opportunity my senior year to then work with Oregon State Baseball. Again, early morning s sessions, jumped in there and just volunteered. And luckily enough, that was when I, that was 2006. The, the team went on to win the World Series, you know, from a co- collegiate perspective, backed up awesome. in 2007. So, so good luck for me to be around some really good programs. And early on, I had not made the connection how important SNC was to baseball until I started to, to engage with it. But for me, I always found, let's say, the skill side of the game almost mm-hmm. more interesting uh, for whatever reason than the SNC side. And I guess we'll, we'll get into that as it goes on. But uh, inevitably from there, went on to work for a place called Athletes Performance uh, was its earliest name, but now it's called Exos. Did a ton in, in baseball there as well, but primarily working with guys from an NFL combine development perspective. And that's where I really started to get interested, let's say, in coaching and communication. Did a lot of coach ed there as well. And I did that for 10 years until I left in 2016 and joined uh, Irish Rugby. So I live in Dublin now and oversee high performance from an s and perspective for our national and our professional teams. So about five six entities in total. So quite a, quite a large remit. But um, if I go back to the very beginning, I think every coach has a story that usually was, was one of um, achievement or one of failure. And mine was a little bit of, of both in that I met a guy named Rudy uh, and Rudy was our high school strength coach. And obviously for those stateside who know the movie, Rudy, he very much so lived up to that kind of character and that he was as big in developing the person 
as he was in developing the player. And even though I had good football coaches and basketball coaches, of all of them, he's the one that stood out because it didn't matter who you were. If you were walking into that gym for the first time or you had been in that gym thousands of times, you know he treated everybody the same with respect and you knew he wanted to get to know you. And so ultimately I saw in Rudy someone who unselfishly with no agenda outside the goodness of his heart was trying to pay it forward and to make others better and so that they could achieve something greater than what they could do on their own. And when I saw that, John, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And it just so happened, it just so happened because it was through the medium of strength and conditioning that I went down that path to impact others. But it, on reflection, I could have gone down many other paths as well, but I know my heart is in is in the world of service and serving others. No, I love that. And, and I love, uh, again, I think we all have a story that's like that. Like you just mentioned, we have a, somebody that made an impact on us and, and we wanted to a, a, instead turn around and, and do the same thing. And, and something that you really challenged me with this spring is I, I think it was one of your opening slides and you just said, you know, mm-hmm. what is a coach? And I, I had never really thought about it. I, in, and in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, they're a teacher, they're, they're very multifaceted and all, they have their hand in all of these different things. But Essentially, they're trying to mold young men or women, in some, in, mm. uh, if you're in the women's sports, uh, into becoming better. And uh, I want you to share with, with our listeners your definition of what a coach is, and, and we can kind of walk through that a little bit together. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I've defined it different ways over the years, and, and most certainly, I think every coach is a good thief. So I, I probably stole this or some version of it from somebody else. But, you know, for me, have. for me, <laughs> for me, when I think of a coach, it's, it's someone that takes someone else from where they are to where they want to be. And I, I think it's that simple. And interestingly enough, when you go back to the core definition of the word coach, if you think about it, they also refer to buses, the big buses at times as a coach and before that if we can think of the the old four wheel you know type uh you know well coaches that were pulled by horses so a stage coach if we think of the old uh western movies and even before that kings and queens and so the word coach early on was connected to a stage coach and so it was a vehicle that could take someone from where they are to where they want to be. And oftentimes a coach allowed them to navigate tough terrain. So possibly uneven roads, rivers, so on and so forth. And inevitably, I think that's kind of cool that this idea of a coach carrying someone from where they are to where they want to be and helping them navigate uncertain terrain, that ultimately our profession would be endowed with that same word. And so that's what we do. We take people from where they are to where they want to be, and we help them do that through uncertain terrain. And thus, we are their guide. They have to walk, but we help them take that path. And so I I love that definition, and it goes right back to the core of where the word came from. Oh, definitely. And and again, I I love that how eloquently you express that. And, you know, obviously that, that uh, you have to be an effective communicator to be able to write a book called the, the language of coaching. (laughs) Right. And so, um, without, you know, sounding too pluggy, I, I have picked it up and I, I know that it is a fantastic read, but really what, so what started you on this journey to really be, or to really pick that as something that you wanted to write about? Like, was it, was it an instance? Was it something that you felt that there was a need? Is it just your passion or, I mean, just kind of what, what took you through, okay, I, I'm a strength coach and now, you know, 10 years later or 15 years later now, you're writing a book on effective communication that, that kind of seems, you know, uh, <laughs> interesting to say the least. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, well, I don't know where it really started. My mom always said I, I talk too much and she's like, my mouth will either get me into trouble or it will make me money or something in between. So I, I think I've always had an interest in language and words, uh, just generally speaking, and who knows why that is. Uh, early on in college, when I was cutting my teeth as a personal trainer just to make some money on the side, 
I first got exposed to a person, his name's JC, who was coaching. And, it, you know, it was by pure chance. I hadn't sought this guy out. He just happened to be the person that I was assigned to, to shadow as a part of this course. And what I started to notice is, man, this, this guy coaches a little bit different. This guy teaches movements in a manner that I've never seen before, but really seems to resonate with all of his, his clients. And he was, I mean, John, he was an intense dude. I'm not going to pretend he wasn't intense. But in that intensity, there was precision. There was purpose. And it almost drew the client in. They wanted to pay attention. And then when he gave them a cue, they seemed to pay attention to it more during the movement. And it seemed to help them. And so early on in working with him, funny enough, I had told another mentor at the time, this is critical. I talk, we talk about programming all the time, but this communication thing is important. And the reality is we do, we talk all the time as well, but we don't give it nearly the same thought as we do the physical program that we're talking about. And I told him, I, I was 19 or 20 at the time, John, and I said, I want to write a book one day called The Form Within. I don't know why I said that, but for me, I just felt compelled. It's like an inner calling had finally revealed itself. Then fast forward to, uh, to 2009. I take over the NFL Combine Development Program at Exos. So for those unfamiliar with that, basically I got 30 of the top NFL prospects in the country. Most of these individuals were already going to go in the first five rounds, most of them number one and two. And my job over an eight-week period is to prepare them to physically perform at the NFL Combine at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis. And so during that process, I took that program over from other strength conditioning coaches who had since actually gone on to work in the NFL. So the physical program, what I was doing, the facility, the reps, the sets, the exercises, the periodization, all that stuff, that was already done. And so in that first year, all I was trying to do was, was not screw it up, considering the caliber of athlete I had with me and the heritage of the program for helping guys make big improvements in, for example, a 40 yard dash, mm -hmm. which by no me, which by no means is the end all be all of performing in the NFL. I think anyone knows that, but it gets a team to take a second look and possibly can put you in better favor come, come the draft. Sure. And so I took this pretty seriously. And when I got to the NFL combine, something really interesting happened. The players, and I think every coach can relate to this, the players ran well. So they ran their 40s, they jumped well. So all the things we had trained for, they had improved. It was almost like a mini Olympics for, for football players. But the interesting thing that I noticed is they hadn't improved as much as I thought they had in that they actually had been running better when they were with me in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And they actually, from a movement quality perspective, and you know all about the importance of technique in baseball, their movement quality was better in Phoenix. So for me, it's like, well, gosh, somehow we lost performance <laughs> between them leaving Phoenix and landing in Indianapolis. And ultimately what I realized was this, the physical program is what had made them better. They had become bigger, faster, stronger, just by putting in the time and in the work. But the only time that they actually moved better with real improvements in movement quality, for the most part, was when I was present, when I was the one doing the cueing, when I was the one doing the reminding. And I realized that we had not maximized our results. And the failure was not the program. It was me, the person, the coach. So when I got back from the combine, I, I just recognized something quite simple, and that is that that what we coach will inevitably make a difference. If you do anything long enough, you will get faster. If you lift enough weights, you will get stronger. If you run enough, you will improve your endurance and so on and so forth. However, the quality of that movement, uh, the technical execution of that movement, the efficiency and effectiveness, which is a massive part of our performance and the ultimate performance of the athlete, uh, that very much so is dictated, in my opinion, on how we coach. So it's how we design our drills, how we cue, how we communicate. And so after that 2009 NFL Combine, I just had this, this inner desire 
to, to learn more, to study more. And my mind went back to that story when I was the 20 year old and watching that other personal trainer coach and communicate. And so that was my first port of call. And so I started studying motor learning and coaching and communication and inevitably found that while oftentimes we call coaching and the soft skill of coaching an art, and most certainly it is, there is a science behind it. Uh, there are principles on which effective communication are based. There are principles in and around the way we should communicate movement, especially if the ideas we are communicating are meant to be thought about or focused on while the athlete is moving in competition. And ultimately, I found my failures. They, they stared me straight in the eye as I started reading these books and all these light bulbs went off. Oh, gosh, I said too much here, or I should have asked a question there, or I shouldn't have talked at all. And that is all stirred in my mind, amalgamated in my practice. And ultimately, once I felt I had committed to this long enough as a coach and applying it and pressure testing it, and as an academic, so to speak, and studying it and coaching other coaches, I felt finally ready to share this with the world. And, and I do believe that every coach on reflection will agree that how we coach gets far less attention than what we coach. And my goal with the language of coaching is to fill that gap. No, I think that's fantastic. And I actually was talking with a, uh, a friend last night about this and, and he's a, he's a hitting coordinator uh, in minor league baseball. And, and he mentioned uh, something similar because they're, they're trying to figure out a way that they can help coaches to get better in this aspect without like making them feel like the gotcha moment. So, yes. uh, so there's some of the, there's some of some other organizations that record their coaches during the day and then they, they review that. And, and it sounds like that that's similar to, to what you were doing for yourself. You were self-reflecting after the day mm. was over, but any advice uh, for someone who is in his situation? Because I thought it was a fascinating, fascinating conversation because he was giving me the, Hey, we want to, we want to help. We want to say, Hey, you're, you're better here. And, and we want to go over it with them, but we don't want them to feel like they're constantly on camera and having to change their style of coaching and not say things that they would say uh, with a player just because they think that the higher ups are not going to um, think that that's okay or, or to just yeah. give them give or, or to just say what they need to say just to, to please the higher ups, if that makes sense. But any advice yeah. from that standpoint, because, because being an effective communicator is absolutely important, but how do we help other coaches with feedback in regards to that? Yeah, it, it's a tough one because any organization knows this. If you try to force someone to change, the very nature of that force is going to get an equal and opposite force in the other direction pushing mm -hmm. back. And so they have to feel a part of the process and they have to feel like they designed the process to some degree that made them better. You know, so I think early on, it's not dissimilar to what we did with you at the Rangers, right? It's not like I was brought in to change anybody. I was asked to come in and share principles around an area that the Rangers and obviously you guys as coaches feel is quite important. And then from there, if that sparks an interest and people say, you know what? Yeah, I agree that this communication piece is really important. And specifically, the communication we use to guide focus to guide intention, since that has the great, since that form of communication, I should say, has the greatest direct impact on learning and the performance of our players, that specifically as a starting point is pretty important. And then the next step from there is, okay, if we agree it's important, um, do we all agree that we should evaluate loosely, but with purpose, where we are at? And would you be an advocate then of us helping you figure out how to improve that if there are opportunities to improve. And so within every organization, John, I think you have to go about that different ways. Mm -hmm. But early on, how do you spark? Okay, that's interesting. How do you guide and review? Okay, here's where I'm at. And then how do you develop? And so from a development perspective, which is kind of where the, the question started, I think there's a lot of different ways. Uh, funny enough, and again, not, not to be shamelessly promoting the book, but mm -hmm. you haven't gotten there yet. But in chapter seven of the book is called The Roadmap. 
because it's funny enough that this is one of your earliest questions in this podcast. Mm-hmm. That is at, at always the last question I get from people. And that is, <laughs> that, that is Nick. I rarely have someone say, I disagree with 15 years of practice and a, a mountain of science. Mm-hmm. And then if intuition is guided, it, it's self-explanatory right there. Very few people uh, disagree let's say, with the key principles that, that I'm trying to share around core communication. But many people recognize to bring it into their communication habits, to bring it into their style of coaching is going to take some work because oftentimes our communication runs on autopilot. We don't give it a lot of thought. We don't reflect on it. We don't evaluate it. Mm-hmm. And I know that's a very broad statement, but let's just call a spade a spade. We wouldn't be having this conversation if this was ever present in every coach's mind, in every organization's mind. And so once we start to look at it, it takes it takes some time. And so early on, you have to have some level of reflection and self-analysis. And so on the low end, that can simply be you reflecting at the end of a session and asking yourself a few questions. What did I say? How did I say it? When did I say it? And did it make an impact positively, negatively, or not at all? And even if you just ask yourself those questions for the critical moments of a session, you know, did I talk during the set? Did I talk before? Okay, I talked before. What did I say? Uh, how did I say it? Did I say it in a strong way, a condescending way, a passive way? But ultimately, the big question, did it make a difference? Gosh, did I even connect my words to the movement? Was I even paying attention? to whether or not they focused on it and whether or not what I asked them to focus on made the specific difference in the element or feature of technique that I was trying to nudge with the words in the first place. And so I think as, as, a, as a base starting point, that is a great practice for every coach to go through when it comes to their communication. Inevitably, you can scale that up. And with my coaches in Irish rugby, working with our S&C guys, and we do the same thing with the actual skill coaches, We'll mic them up. We'll put them on camera. We do not do it every day, and nor do I think you need to do it every day. But maybe you do it two or three times over a six-month period just to kind of check in, and then it might be once every six months. The key is the coach has to believe and buy into it. But after we do the video with the audio recording, I just I send the video to the coach, and I give them very little guidance. I say, I want you to watch the video, and – Let's, you know, let's not talk about your programming. Okay, we'll put that on the side here. I just want you to watch how you operated in the session. When you're talking, when you're not talking, beginning, middle, and end. And I simply want you to write down what are the elements of how you coach that you really liked, that are strengths, that if you were going to give a presentation at a conference, right, these are some of the video clips you'd want to show. Okay, that's category A. Category B I want you to identify what are some of the areas of your coaching that you might want to improve or you might want to reflect on or at the very least in that moment for that movement for that person didn't seem to be working and possibly reflect on why that is. And then third, is there anything that you did not see that you think you should be seeing? I.e., are there any behaviors or habits that you did not apply that that maybe you should have? Right. And so maybe one might be, gosh, I didn't ask a single question in the entire session. Maybe there would be value in asking questions in future sessions. And so if they do that, and then for me, let's say trained in coach education and this area of of, of skill acquisition in coaching language, I then do it as well. So we do it blindly and then we come back together and have a discussion. But John, they're the one that drives the discussion. They're the one that drives where they want to go, where they want to be, their strengths, their limitations. And I'm a mirror. I'm echoing. I'm asking questions. And ultimately, there will always be more things to improve than anyone should ever focus on at any one time. And the key for that coach is just prioritizing. And so maybe for them, the first thing that they prioritize is giving less cues. They notice that, hey, I I say three or four things every time before they move. And we kind of on reflection say, gosh, I, I know there's no possible way that this player uh, swinging a baseball bat or throwing a ball can be thinking about four things simultaneously in a fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. So how do we pick out the one big thing 
that can make that next rep, that next set, that next bullpen, that next at bat better. And so that might be the one takeaway. And they go at that for a week or two and then they come back and review. And so that's, that, that's probably a, a long winded answer, but it is a, co- it's a complex question. And it's one that needs to fit the individual and fit the environment. But the key is get the spark, get the buy-in, align on the process, and have some flexibility in the way that process is guided by the individual the process is meant to change. And you know what's interesting with with that answer, because I, I thought that was fantastic, but if I had – if and and let me rephrase the question too here. If I had asked you – and if I, if I heard that answer and then I, I then asked you, was I talking about a player or was I talking about a coach? I think you could, <laughs> you could put both of them in there because you that could. should be our process with players as well. Cause you're talking about getting the spark, getting the buy-in, letting them become their own best coach. And then in, in return, like coaching the coaches, it should be a very similar thing. So I guess, I guess the roadmap is not necessarily that complicated, but it's, it's maybe changing mm-hmm. our mindset about it. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, what we're doing here is whether we're talking about a movement, we're talking about nutrition, or we're talking about coaching communication, John, all of these are behaviors. All of these are habits. And habits uniquely are a type of memory. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it over and over again. Right. Okay, so habit is a type of memory, but it's a type of memory that doesn't require you to consciously remember. And that's what's really interesting about it. I get up and I swing. Why do you swing that way? I don't know. I get up at night and I eat after dinner. Why do you do that? I don't know. I just do. Why do you give that cue? I don't know. I just do. So habits are a form of memory that doesn't require conscious remembering. And because it doesn't require conscious remembering, oftentimes it operates on autopilot. You just grab that extra bag of chips. You give that three extra cues when you should only be giving one, you revert back to that movement behavior because that's how you've always swung, so on and so forth. And so to change these habits, we must first recognize that they exist. We must be conscious of them, whether that's changing a movement, changing nutrition nutrition and dietary habits, or change, changing a coaching behavior. And that's one of the biggest things you're right I try to outline in the book, and when I go coach coaches on this, like you spend your life changing behaviors, Mm -hmm. changing habits on and off the field, and you know how difficult it is. Well, let me then just be the first to say what you are about to engage in is putting you on the other side of the line. You are now going to have to try to engage in changing your own behavior, to change something that you do day in, day out with no conscious awareness of it. And that's difficult. However, just like you've had success changing your athlete's behavior with a purposeful, precise program or a roadmap as I call it, this roadmap will help you as well and it's flexible to adapt to your needs. So you're spot on. Coaching is a skill and within those skills, there are habits, good habits and bad habits. And thus, that's why we have to be so purposeful in developing this because many of us are not aware of how it currently operates. No, I'm right there with you. And, you know, something that that when we hear communication, most of the time we're, we're talking about spoken words. And, you know, so since I've started this podcast and this is there's there's two big like shifts in my life on how I I feel like I have been forced to become a better communicator still working on it every day, obviously, but editing audio for this podcast with almost 200 (laughs) episodes and listening to myself has made me try to become a better communicator. And then obviously my background is in teaching and standing in front of a group of, you know, 30 to 35 students every single day has helped me to become a better communicator. And, you know, listening to you speak, your, your cadence is good. You have like your wait time, which I, I think that is really important. You don't have, you don't have filler words. You're not saying, um, uh, you, you are very precise. You change your tone. And so how, how do we learn those things? Because the more I <laughs> dig into becoming a really good storyteller, uh, the more that I think that, that it really is trying to captivate an audience, which sometimes it's an audience of one. And sometimes for yeah. you, it's an audience of a couple, couple hundred, uh, but 
how, you know, where would you start as far as that goes? Because I, I think that's also another uh, important key piece in communication as well. Yeah, no, uh, well, one hundred percent, and I'm uh, I'm humbled by your comments. Like you, it's a, it's a constant journey, but one one that I enjoy being on. And you know, I think that's the key. You have to want to get better at these skills because they're elusive skills. They're they're not things like we said that we oftentimes think about. Nobody mm-hmm. gets in front of a crowd of people wanting to say ah oh, um sure. like. Nobody wants to be that way, yet many of us, that's how we come across to others. And there's a number of factors underneath that. So I'll answer the question with a couple different layers. First and foremost, my experience has been like you, and that is very early on in my career, I just had a natural, I had an opportunity, one, and an affinity for coaching coaches. So right back to college, I inevitably was the the lead educator for this personal trainer certification course that I had gone through and met that original coach. And then when I get to athletes performance, they had just started the athletes performance mentorship. So that was kind of right in my wheelhouse. I started supporting that early on. And so in terms of hours of presenting, I probably presented for as many hours as I have coached. And I've done a lot on both sides of, of the fence. And you're right. Presenting is a very different beast. You, you become aware. You become aware of features of your language, features of your words, your communication that maybe you're not as aware of when you're coaching, maybe due to the, the informal nature of it. But nonetheless, I felt being a coach allowed me to be a more engaging conversational presenter, but being a presenter allowed me to be a, a clear communicator and a more precise communicator with my players as well as being more selective with language. So I think like you having, having that, that ability and that exposure on both sides has helped me work on these key features. Now the question that many listeners might have, especially if they're coaches, well, heck, I'm not a coach educator. I don't want to stand in front of a hundred people or 30 people and give a lecture, but I love working with my players and I love communicating with my players. How can I bring some of these elements forward? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is identify what you and I are talking about. And so I think there are three core elements that go into communication, whether you are presenting in front of a thousand people or coaching one person. And that is the words we use. So the physical content of our language, our tone of voice, which is our pitch, our pace, our loudness, so on and so forth. And then finally, our nonverbal, our body language. And so simply put, not simple to execute, but but simply to describe, I believe the best communicators do the following. Their words, tone of voice, and body language tell one story, and they tell the right story for that moment. Mm -hmm. And so if if I'm telling a sad story, my pace slows down. Possibly my pause increases and I hang on the hard moment or I hang on the moment before the hard moment. And in doing that, that's very different than if I'm telling an exciting story about the time my son learned how to ride his bike. And the second I let him go and he pushed on and he got 20 meters before he banged into the wall and we mm-hmm. came and gave a – you see what I'm – so it's that ability to bring the word, words, tone, and body language that are right for that person – in that moment. And I think even just that as a starting point, John, to become aware that those three things operate verbal and nonverbal, and that translates quite a bit on the recipient side of what they're hearing, experiencing, and engaging with, that that as a starting point is a good barometer, a good checklist to go through. Did my words, tone of voice, and body language align, or did my body language or tone undermine actually what I was trying to say. Because if I talk in this slow, monotone pace, but I'm trying to encourage you to jump as high as you can, there's a disconnect. My words and my tone do not match up. And so Mm -hmm. the best storytellers have a good story, but they're the best at telling the story. It's the telling part that's the nonverbal body language and the tone that we need to think of. And so as a resource... 
as a resource because I don't get into body language and tone directly in my book, even though if I do a second edition, I will, is a guy named Julian Treasure. And Julian Treasure is a top five, has a top five TED Talk in terms of views of all time. He has five total. And one of them, I can send it to you, John, to put in the notes, actually is a 15-minute spiel on tone and the vocal toolbox, which is quite awesome. And so by the very fact that you're asking that question, I I love that because very few people dive into that. But I think as a coach, body language and tone of voice does so much of the work for you when it comes to engagement, motivation, and memorability. No, definitely. And another thing that that I know that, that you do well just from talking with you in the last 35 minutes or, or whatever we've been on is, is you also use my name whenever you are referring to. So that makes it a little bit more personal for me because I'm like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I'm, and we're not just having a conversation uh, to a crowd, but that's just another thing that I picked up that I, that I think you do well. And again, I, I'm not trying to sit here and brag upon you, but I do think that you are an effective communicator and I want to make sure I bring that to light. Uh, but as far as, as coaching goes, so uh, it would be, uh, I would be remiss if we didn't get into some actual skill development since you basically yeah. have your PhD in that. So let's talk about that a little bit. And so I, I think that during this time, uh, again, when we're recording this, we're in the middle of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we're, we're, we're trying to reevaluate some different things that we are doing. And so one thing that I, that I think that we as coaches we want to do is upgrade skills. Like it, we, when we make players better, we become a better coach. And so uh, what is your advice on where do we start? So I know that, that it's going to have, have a lot to do with communication cues, effective communication, and we can just get the ball rolling as far mm. as that goes. But whenever we're talking about upgrading a skill as, as any sort of coach, where, where do we start? And then like, what does that conversation look like with the player? Yeah, it's uh, how long do we have here, John? I'm gonna try. Right, to take yeah, this that's one. a very deep. I'm gonna try question. to. It's, it's a big question. It's a it's a big question. But no, I, funny enough, I did a, an Instagram post on this very question last night, and, and I said before you can reflect on how to coach, mm-hmm. <laughs> you need to know what you're coaching, and so I think that's a good place to start when it comes to the question that you have asked, and so. Whether we're talking baseball, sprinting, basketball, rugby, the sport I work in, or or, or teaching someone to have a better squat, the answer is going to be the same. And there are many different models or ways to approach this, but the one that that I like to use to answer the question is called the 3P performance model. Mm -hmm. And when I'm working with, when I'm working with a chapter one, exactly, when I'm working with an athlete, I want to be very clear that what we are looking to change or upgrade is worth changing or upgrading. And by that, I mean, if we go through the effort of making a change, that the net outcome, as as best we can can guess, is going to improve their performance, however you define performance. And so that's, that's a big task. And so you need to have a systematic, I believe you need to have a systematic approach to go about that. And so when you then look at the thing you are trying to change, I believe it falls into one of two categories. And at the end of the day, it's usually both, but one of two key categories. And I'll start with the analogy to keep it very simple. And that is, is the problem we're trying to fix a car problem or a driver problem? And so I'm going to give some different words there, synonyms. Uh, Instead of car, you can think of, is it a mechanical problem or a physical problem with the body? And on the driver's side, is it a technical problem or is it a coordination patterning problem? So we can come up with many different words, but I like the idea of car and driver. Car, physical assets required to do the thing. Driver, the person who's actually doing it. And we know that they both are critical using the following thought experiment. If I drop a Formula One race car into your driveway, It doesn't all of a sudden mean you can drive like a Formula One racer. But equally, if I take a Formula One racer and give them some beat up old VW Beetle, they're not going to win the Grand Prix in that. And so we need to have the body capable of achieving something and the brain 
capable of bringing those achievements to light through technique, coordination, and skill. And so these two big buckets, I believe, are important because to change the body, to change the car, I call that, it's a trainable feature. I'm going to have to get into the gym. I'm going to have to get with my physical therapist to get my mobility, stability, strength, and power, so on and so forth. But on the driver's side, on the technical side, well, those changes are subject to the one-to-one interaction, right, between the coach and the player. And that change can come through the course of the way I design drills or what we might call constraints or the way I communicate and guide intention and focus with my language. And so back to then the model, the 3P model is what we use to identify, is it a car problem? Is it a driver problem or some combination thereof? Okay, so the first P is called position. And very simply put, can they get in the positions necessary to perform their skill? So we can imagine in baseball, there's a lot of internal and external rotation Mm -hmm. at the shoulder, at the hip, at the spine that a a pitcher or a hitter is going to need to have to perform their skill effectively. A shortstop is going to need X amount of hip flexion to be able to get down and field the ball. So there's these fundamental raw materials of mobility and stability that collectively allow you to get into these critical skill-relevant positions. And so this is where the relationship with the strength conditioning coach and the physical therapist is important. Can we assess and screen to make sure that those fundamentals are are there? Check the box. The second P then is power. Do they have the requisite strength and power to optimally perform the skill? And so think of it as the engine in the car. Do they have the right engine for the right vehicle or are they underpowered? And especially when we look at, we call them power hitters, strength and power is going to be critical for their ability to move the ball over the fence. And so that might be a limiting factor, not their technique. But then the final piece is pattern. Can they actually take position A, the bat is back, (laughs) position B, they've now swung through and followed through, can they actually pattern that together? Equally from a pitching perspective, starting on the mound to releasing the ball from position A to position B, can they pattern, can they connect that together? So when we look at those three Ps, they combine together to dictate my ultimate performance. And so to bring it back in in summary, the car is represented by your ability to get into the positions, mobility, stability, and your underpinning engine, your strength and power required to perform the movement. Position and power represent the car. And then finally, the pattern, that represents the driver. And so in the spirit of baseball, and knowing that many of the people listening are probably on the skill side of the sport, we just need to clearly identify within this player's IPP, their individual performance plan, Mm -hmm. which of their issues are driver issues and which of their issues are car issues. For anything that's a car issue, We're working with the strength coach and the physical therapist to mend those in parallel, knowing that any possible technical features connected to those are going to be a bit more of a slow burn because they have to take time to develop that mobility, to develop that strength, so on and so forth. On the flip side, we now have what's left. These are all the driver problems. And all the driver problems, those are great to prioritize and understand, John, because now they know what can I coach. What could I feasibly expect to change right now in this session that with the right cue, with the right constraint, we can make the change? And to put a nice little bow on that, a sprint coach who who I look up to named Stu McMillan says this, you can't fix a mechanical problem with a technical cue. Or put differently, you can't fix a car problem with a driver cue. And so you need to be able to decipher those. But once you've done that deciphering, now we can open up the discussion, John, around cues and constraints, which are fundamentally our verbal and nonverbal tools to change the pattern, to change the way the person moves. No, I love that. And and again, um, I think you do a really good job of presenting a lot of information in a succinct manner. So I really do appreciate that. We could do our an entire probably 10 hour podcast on upgrading skills. But I I also know from experience and a lot of it 
that we sometimes measure short-term success and think that it is learned skills. Uh, yes. And so I, I, I really want to want to ask you, so let's say that we're working with, with a player and, you know, we, we think that we've have it, we have it figured out, but how do we know if they actually retain it long-term or if it's just, uh, you know, a, again, a short-term success that we can pat ourselves on the back and go, Hey, I'm the greatest coach ever. I fixed this kid in five minutes, but how do we actually know that, uh, that it's long-term that it is retained long-term because I think we've all been there where we thought the player had learned something. And then they, the minute that they see, you know, a live competition, it completely falls apart. So what would your advice be on the coaches who are curious about that? Yeah, really, really good question. And fundamentally, if a coach knows the answer to that question, that's all the information they need to get better. Because if you know what learning looks like, then you're also going to know what it doesn't look like. (laughs) And therefore, if you continue to see a player if you continue to see a player that does not appear to learn, what's that going to force you to do? It's going to force you to put the mirror up and say, well, do they have a problem understanding or do I have a problem teaching? And it goes back to Mr. Wooden's quote, you have not taught until they've learned. So they're intimately uh, intertwined. And there are many, uh, there are many red herrings in coach, in coaching in that we think that they've improved when they're in our presence, mm-hmm. right? We get this breakthrough, what we think is a light bulb moment, and then they go pitch on the weekend <laughs> or they get up at bat on the weekend and it's like they've reverted right back to type. They've reverted mm-hmm. back to all those bad habits. And I know that's kept many a coach uh, up at night pulling out what hair they, they have left. And the question is, well, why is that? And I think part of the answer can be found in the question you've asked, and that is to first define what learning is. And so while there are many definitions, I'm going to try to put forth a a simple one. Learning is the athlete's ability to express a change without the stimulus that caused it. And so here's what I mean by that. If I'm working with you in a bullpen, and I'm using cues, or I'm using physical constraints in the environment, maybe a weighted ball, whatever it might be. If you now take the change we achieved in that session and you've integrated it, you've owned it, it's now been downloaded onto your hardware, that means whether or not you know it, when you go into that subsequent competition, you're going to be able to express it. It's now become part of you. It's your new normal. You have been upgraded. Um, However, if you require my presence as your coach, if you require my reminders as your coach, if you require me to pull out the T to refine your technique every time you get into the cage or do live BP, if you require me to pull out a certain drill that you do to centrate your body or get realignment or find the feel to be able to achieve something, if it requires my presence and my reminders, for you to bring it forward into the real world, then you have not learned yet. That's the key, yet. You have not owned it yet. And so that's what I think coaches have to remember. The best coaches make themselves redundant in that they're no longer needed. But in doing that, the athlete has such a good experience with you and they gain so much from you that the irony is they want to keep coming back because they keep getting more from you. A good teacher is a giver, and what they give can be taken away with the athlete into competition, right? A good coach does not want to develop dependence, Mm. because by the very nature, by the very nature, you are not being a good coach if they depend on you. A coach takes someone from where they are to where they want to be. Imagine if I take you from where you are to where you want to be, But every time the session is over, I take you back to where you were originally. (laughs) I don't think anyone signs up for that. I just flew to Barbados. Why am I still back in Phoenix, Arizona? And so that's what happens every time we use coaching methods inadvertently, non-maliciously, that don't translate. And so how do we how do we then assess? Well, funny enough, when I was with you guys, uh, I, I got to see how different coaches apply this. 
-hmm. And one such coach I thought did it brilliantly. And that is he was working with a pitcher and he was just asking them some questions. And inevitably, it came to find out that the way one pitch felt could be applied, not the same pitch, but the way it felt, could be applied to improve a different pitch. And so he said, well, why don't you try to give that same feeling on your slider, for example? And he did it, and it worked. And they were trying to put more force behind the pitch, I believe. And so he said, so what did you, what did you focus on there? He gave, he gave the player complete autonomy to guide it. He just used questions to corral the player to the right mindset. And inevitably, after a few more pitches, the coach stopped and said, great, fantastic, we're done here. But then in talking with that coach afterwards, I said, okay, so how are you going to find out if that stuck? I said, well, the next session that comes in, I'm not going to say a dang thing. I'm not going to remind him. I'm not going to repeat. And I'm going to watch with my eyes before I speak with my mouth. And I'm like, that's it. And in my world, I'd use different words, but I call that the silent set. The silent set is an opportunity for the athlete to own the change or at least prove to themselves and the coach that they can own the change. And so if you have a big breakthrough session, I believe the next session should have a fair number of silent sets. And they might not get it right, but if it looks like they're, they, they've regressed a little bit, John, but it's like they're almost there, I might give them two or three sets. See if they can self-correct. If every time my boy, when I taught him how to ride his bike, if every time he's about to fall, I go catch him, he never learns how to ride that bike. Right. And so I create this safe space with silent sets. And as long as it looks like they're exploring and they're working their way back onto the bike, they're working their way back onto the trail, so to speak, I'm going to let them stick with it. Because the act of learning requires you to forget and then remember. That's what learning is. It's remembering things that you once learned, right? And so I have to let you struggle. I have to let you try to find the feel, find that technique again. And it's only when either A, you found it, that I can then in my mind say, some learning has occurred here. Or B, you fall off the bike again and again. You fall off the trail again and again. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. I need to reinforce or I need to redirect. And it's just this constant process. It's constant process. But if you don't give those silent sets, you're not going to be able to assess your efficacy in training. And then ultimately, it is competition. If what you're doing is not making its way under the lights, you've got to ask yourself some hard questions. You do. Right. No, I like that a lot. And, and you know, I, I think for, for us as coaches, that's hard. Sometimes I know that you would probably agree with that, that we would rather just tell them and help, but sometimes we're wrong. And, and then sometimes that also, it doesn't make it sticky and, and stick long-term. But one thing that, that I have taken from that lately, there was an article about the Dodgers and Justin Turner was talking about, and this was completely, completely different context. He was talking about how they don't have many rules, but they provide bumpers and sometimes mm -hmm. uh, I think about it from like a bowling analogy, which I know you, you like analogies, uh, speaking of, but, uh, but like the bumpers on the sides. So whenever you're learning to bowl, uh, it kind of mm -hmm. hits the side and goes yeah, back into sure. the middle. And so I, I thought that that was really, really well put with him. And then I took it from, hey, that's, that's kind of what we are as coaches. We're just trying to push them along and be bumpers whenever they need us. But another thing that that uh, I've got two more questions for you and I know you, yeah. you've got to run pretty soon, but uh, another really neat challenge that we get to have uh, a lot of us that are listening is we get to work with players from different cultures, backgrounds and languages. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's, that's a, that's a challenge that I, that I relish, but it's also something that is really, it's hard at times because uh, communication is not just verbal. It's it, like you mentioned, it's also tone. It's also body language. Yeah. It's also cultural. Yeah. Uh, and so some things that we do here in the States are different than what they do overseas, which I'm sure you've, you figured that out too, even, even though you, they speak English in Ireland. Well, I, yeah. I think they speak pretty good English. I don't know if I could understand half of what they're saying, <laughs> but, uh, but what, what's your best advice? Because again, language of coaching, being an effective communicator, we also work with kids who English is their second language and they're trying to learn English like we're trying to learn Spanish uh, for the most part. And so what, what would be your best advice for us working in that realm? Yeah, I'll, I'll make a general comment because, you know, while 
the the obvious challenge is with someone that doesn't speak your language mm-hmm. or speaks your language as a second language. We we equally have this same exact challenge with, with people that do speak our same language uh, as a Absolutely first language. Correct. Anyone yeah. who's been confused, you know, or had that athlete look at him and say, "So what do you want me to do?" or "What did you say?" or didn't get your movie quote, whatever it might be. We know that these challenges occur across the map. And so Julian Treasure, the gentleman I mentioned earlier on in the podcast, who has the TED Talks, he says something really powerful. He says, before you can be understood, you must seek to understand. And he means what he means by that is when I communicate, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, I'm always communicating from a state of my own understanding. I say words, I give examples, I use visuals, I use a tone, I use body language that makes sense to me, that resonates with me. Otherwise, if it's just natural human communication, I would not be saying it. By the very fact that the words and the way I'm saying it comes out of my mouth is because that's the way I am. And what we quickly come to realize as coaches, and I think as adults, is not everyone thinks the same. Not everyone processes the same. Not everyone uses the same words. We come from different generations. We come from different cultures. And so I'm not driven to speak my language. If I really want to be a good communicator, I need to be a chameleon. And I need to be driven to speak your language. And so to speak your language, I must first seek to understand before I can be understood. And I think as a general philosophical statement, you can cash that check at the bank no matter who you work with, okay? And it goes back to the old adage, get to know the person inside of the player. Mm -hmm. Now, when we get to the brass tacks of actually working with someone who does not speak English at all, if you speak English as as a first language, you know, or doesn't necessarily have the vocabulary that you do, and thus many of your words are going to fall down because of a lack of comprehension. I think that's where we have to go to, as you rightly identify, that there are many different ways to impart understanding. And for me, when I talk about communication, I say our goal is to cap is to hide technical language inside short phrases that put an interesting picture in the mind of the athlete. And so if we just jump to the end of that statement, interesting picture. Well, I can move off language completely and start dealing in the realm of the visual. And so you obviously have a copy of the book. One thing I've tried to do in the book is show the power of visuals in conveying the meaning behind many of the cues and the analogies that we use. Uh, Equally, I will use physical tactics, what I typically call cue props. And so What a cue prop is, is something you use in the physical environment to demonstrate technique. So you could use a dowel to demonstrate spine position. You could use a band, pulling on a band, to represent lengthening or tension through length and then a recoil. You could use an object with a hinge to articulate looseness around a fixed axis. You could use a pencil to show body position. You could break a pencil to show the suddenness of a snap. Uh, You could use a snap bracelet that I get from my daughter to articulate how two things connect together or can quickly wrap around. And I think if you just look around your office, you're going to have a bunch of junk just sitting around that can quickly be used as a visual analogy. And while obviously we can use video and we can use physical demonstration, I think we both know that athletes can kind of become numb to that stuff. But if I pull out a pencil and I do some kind of very simple articulation and I break that pencil to articulate the snap of the hips that I'm looking for on ball contact, John, I think that's going to send a bit more of a message and a bit more of a feel than just trying to draw some diagram or show someone on a video that's really good at it. And so whether I use pictures, video, props, The final thing that I do quite a bit of, and again, it's profiled in the book, and I just did an Instagram on this the other day, is we have have Q props, we also have Q tape. And with Q tape, what I'll do is rather than referencing the body, I'll put a piece of tape on the body and reference where I want that piece of tape to move. 
Now, you need to understand a little bit of the science of external cueing to get this, but thinking about the movement of a piece of tape on the body is very different than thinking about the body part the piece of tape is on. So let me give a very simple example. When I was coaching a guy for the NFL Combine, he struggled to get good extension out of the start. So he kind of was hunched as he was coming out of it and thus wasn't able to get a good push. He wasn't as powerful. And because he was a lineman, the first 10 meters was critical. And so what I did to illustrate this pointer on cue tape is I put a piece of tape on his lower back, literally a piece of tape you get from the training room, your athletic trainer, piece of tape on the lower back, piece of tape on the upper back. Okay. And it was on his shirt. It wasn't even on his body. I'm not talking kinesio tape here. And so I said to him, show me what it looks like when the pieces of tape get far apart. And he flexed down pulling them away from each other. Show me what the piece of tape looked like when they get close together. And he got up nice and tall. I said, perfect. And he kind of smiled. He knew where I was going with this. And I said, I want you to, when you get off that line, I want you to slam those pieces of tape together. And so he got on the line, boom, busts out of there, back extends, hip extends. He jams out of the start, explodes forward better than he ever had. Okay, and he, he ends up doing that victory lap of an extra 30 yards, smiling all the way back. And what it illustrates is he was trying to maneuver all these joints, even though I was using simple cues, he was getting in his own head. And so I got rid of all that and put two simple points, tape on the upper back, tape on lower back, didn't mention the body, bring the tape together. And I think with the subtle technical realities of hitting and pitching, there's many instances where we could put a piece of tape on the elbow, piece of tape on the hip, and we could either orient the tape with the environment or possibly use two pieces of tape on the body and orient them together. Now, I don't know your sport as well as you do, John, or the people listening, but hopefully that unlocks a treasure trove of ways you can use that. And I think even if someone speaks English as a second language, putting a piece of tape on them and saying tape goes from here to here – is going to be far easier than trying to articulate that using words. So cue props, cue tape, and your various visual type uh, approaches. I love that. And, and that was that was something that you mentioned last time. And I think if I recall correctly, you're taking an internal cue, uh, such as the knee, putting tape on it, and then turning it into now it's an external cue because now Bingo. we – Okay, and now okay, it, because now we don't have already those the neuro the basically the neurological response to our knee is going to be different from different learned experiences yeah. than the new added tape will be, and so that yeah. that was something that I, I honestly haven't tried it yet, but it was something that I wrote down in my notes of hey things that I need to to dig into, but the last question that 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 I want to leave our listeners with because I, I think that you have the unique opportunity to have worked with a lot of different coaches from a lot of different fields and a lot of different levels. And so mm -hmm. whenever you watch practice or whenever you go and watch, like you came out and, and watched us for spring training for a couple of days, mm -hmm. or, or you go to different parts of the country and listen to guys speak, what distinguishes good coaches from coaches that aren't as successful? Their athletes listen to them. Full I stop. Love that. love that. Absolutely. If I, if, if I want, I mean, let's be honest. It goes right back to first principles. If they're not paying attention to me, or if they're paying attention with body, meaning my body is, is facing you, <laughs> but I'm not paying attention inside my head. We know our athletes drift. We know they do. Okay. But if they're not paying attention, you have no chance of teaching them anything, anything. And so when I go to a session and I'm almost seeing that player who instead of leaning back on their back hip, you can tell that their mind is somewhere else versus the athlete that's leaning in is on the front foot, eye contact, eye contact. As that coach moves, their eye contact moves with the coach as if they are trying to soak up every word, every insight that that coach is giving. I believe the best coaches I've ever worked with or seen, if I'm standing 100 feet away, I can't hear a dang thing that's what I'm going to be observing. They are listening. They are listening with their eyes, their ears, and their body. No, I love that. I, again, I don't. I don't think you could have given a better answer. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. And man, that that was fantastic. But I know you've got to run, and and I know that uh, you've got a son who wants to go outside and and <laughs> and play. Uh, I'm the same way. But if our listeners want to get in contact with you, what's the best way to do so? Yeah, for sure. So and from an email perspective, if anything 
today triggered an insight, you have a question, uh, info at thelanguageofcoaching.com. Uh, John, as I think you know, my website, thelanguageofcoaching.com, there's free monthly webinars. I've got a free two-hour mini course on there. So all that's there if you, if you subscribe. Otherwise, I try to put out useful short sound bites on a daily basis uh, on Twitter and Instagram at Nick Winkleman. And, and the book is now available at, at Human Kinetics, Apple, and Amazon. Perfect. And I'll, I'm going to open up the mic for you. Is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? No. I just think by the very nature, if you're still listening to this, if you've gotten through an entire podcast, I appreciate you. At the end of the day, we say great coaches are trying to take someone from where they are to where they want to be. And I just appreciate being a part of your journey. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, which can include Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please share it on social media to help get the word out. Once again, thank you for joining us.